Jessica Ryan. <sighs> That's my intro? <laughs> <laughs> it is now. <laughs> Deep sigh. Oh, I'll add the fine details later. Well, you haven't had any time to prepare for this. So. No, not at all. Yeah. The Thai food was lovely. That was delicious. Super Thai food? Super Thai! Super Thai! <laughs> what can we call this Thai restaurant? We need something catchy <laughs> and something <man>. quick. <laughs> yes. that was, yeah, that was really good. Um, so it's nice to be back in your house. Can we actually turn the fan on in here? Nope. <laughs> oh, because of the sound? Okay. Stay cool, Jessica. Oh, you turn the hot, cold air off? Yeah. Okay. No problem. No problem. I won't put you in the hot seat. Um, so how would you actually introduce me? Don't even worry about it. Really? Yeah, yeah. I, I really want an introduction. Well, assume you already had one. Oh. We could talk about this later, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. Sure, I'll just let you run the show. Yeah. But really, it's your show, so... Oh, it's my show now? Yeah, yeah so get started. Okay. Welcome to Friends with Deficits. I'm your guest, Jessica Ryan. I'm a wedding and events planner with my own company, Three of Cups Events. I also manage a nonprofit venue in Austin, the Sanctuary Event Space, which benefits the Amala Foundation. I just finished eating Thai food with Adam Sultan, the host of this podcast, and we're drinking margaritas made with Sotol in place of tequila. Enjoy the show. Delicious. Okay, so... My deficit, right? Health issues, mainly. Believe it or not, it's not mental health. Um, Are you sure? So I was born with gastroschisis. I believe that's how you pronounce it. Gastros. Gastroschisis. Gastroschisis. Yeah, we could Google it. Not now. All right. It, yeah. It's really funny because I pretty much just grew up as the girl that had a huge scar on her stomach between my ribs going all the way down my stomach. So it's probably, what would you say, like 12 inches long? Yeah. We'll post pictures, yeah. <laughs> oh, no. Right. Um, Maybe for my younger days when I was right. like, could wear a bikini. You were known as that girl? Like people... Well, knew. I mean, like, I was definitely teased about it. Right. Like, the, I would be called Inside Out Girl, Ew. which is actually kind of cool. Because I was born Inside Out, like, not entirely, which I think actually is another deficit that people have. Anyway, no, just the intestine were born on the outside of my body. But here's the thing is I didn't grow up with my intestine hanging outside of my body. So it wasn't like I knew that was what happened. I just grew up with this scar and was like teased about it. Well, let's, let's back up. Yeah. How do you get, how do you, how are you born with your intestines hanging like, outside your body? And it's how to, so I, weird. And the ironic thing about talking to you about it today is I had never in my entire life even Googled it to see what it looked like for infants to be born with gastroschisis with their intestine on the outside of their body. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like six years ago or something. Yeah. It was the first time I saw a picture of it. And that was, that was pretty intense because I actually had never thought, you know, I asked my mom. I think that's, that's my main source of information. I was just like, what, it, what did it look like? And she's like, oh, <laughs> this is what she told me. She's like, Oh, it just looked like you had a sausage hanging out of your body. <laughs> <laughs> and so, like, you know, I just think about, like, you know, you go to Central Market and you're picking out, like, which sausage you want. Uh, I was just like, oh, yeah, it's just, like, hanging off this baby, you know. And I, I uh, guess I didn't really uh, question it very much. But my mom, okay, so I was born in 1984. When she was pregnant with me, I think she was really worried about exposing me to x-rays. And so she didn't do the ultrasound for them to diagnose that I was gonna be born with gastroschisis. And she was like 19, 20, you know what I mean? So really young mom. Because an ultrasound isn't an x-ray anyway. But isn't that how you see the baby? Yeah, but they don't, it's, they don't use x-rays to do it. Well, I don't, yeah. I don't know what the thing was, but. Okay. I, I, you know. She was not into it. She just. She thought she was just like taking the best care of me 
And so it was a big surprise. I mean, I was there, but I don't know what they were talking about. I don't remember. Um, <laughs> and so there's really cool video of me in the hospital. That education came into play when I was probably in my mid twenties. I never knew this video footage existed. Like a home movie? Yeah. <laughs> you know, my grandfather got a VHS camera. Um, it's funny because I didn't, I was heading out to Burning Man mm -hmm. and I was staying with my granny's house and I wanted to watch my parents' wedding video. And now they were married April 28th, I think 1984. And I was born February 21st, 1984. Mm -hmm. But the weird thing about the tape is we get to the end of my parents' wedding video and it, <laughs> you know, like old school VHS. <laughs> yeah. Transitions into my pop-up holding the VHS camera. So, you know, he, you hear his narrative the, the entire time throughout this time that I'm in the hospital. And he is holding the camera up to the, the glass mm -hmm. window looking in to, is it the nursery? What do you call it like with a, all the babies? Was it like an incubator or a... Kind of. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the better way to explain it, I think, is the cocoon. The cocoon. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I love the you repeating that. It sounds so much better. So, okay. So imagine he's standing outside looking through the glass, videotaping, and he's able to zoom up on all of the machinery, like 1984 machinery, right? Not to be confused with 1984. Not futuristic dystopian. Does not look futuristic <laughs> yes. at all. It looks okay. old school 80s machinery on a VHS camera. Yeah. And I'm hooked up, you know, I have the tubes on me and when my parents or my grandparents talk about it, it's like anytime I sneeze, like everything would go like, <laughs> like set off all these alarms and stuff. And I'm hooked up to a tube through my nose, through my throat and through my chest. So I still have stitch marks mm -hmm. from where those tubes went in. But around my whole abdomen was, it almost looked like a beehive. That's why I call it a cocoon. Mm. So they completely encased my little baby body in this hard exterior kind of shell. It really did, like if you imagine what, if it was like a white beehive, right? And like a baby's <laughs> head to you. It's, it's so, so weird, weird to explain this. It still looked cute, okay? <laughs> and um, the the video takes place over time. So, you know, it'll cut out and it'll go to like the next time they came to the hospital and visit me. And over time, there's less and less of this, this cocoon. The whole idea is, okay, the intestine in the womb um, expands. Like imagine you have like a sponge, right? Mm -hmm. So if it fills with water, it's gonna grow. Well, I guess that's what happens with intestines is they like swell when they're not contained into your stomach, which might be why I always look pregnant. Mm -hmm. I don't know. And um, they would, in, in India, what they do when they don't have like these fancy cocoons and stuff, because mm -hmm. a lot of babies are born with it, but the, the doctor that was taking care of me was from India and he would say, oh, what we would do there is take wet t-shirts we keep them wet and put them over the stomach of the baby. And then every day come over and squeeze Whoa. the fluid. Like, <laughs> I know it sounds delicious. Squeeze it out of the sausage, you know, squeeze, squeeze that juice <laughs> yeah. out of the sausage part. And so they were doing this where it was, where it was like the cocoon would have a tube and it would drain it. And it would shrink, shrink more and more until they were able to put it back in my body and sew me up, which is why I have the huge scar. Do you know like how much of your intestines were on the outside of your body? Was I it? guess all of them. I mean, like I said, I was there, but I wasn't really there. Right. You know, I, it was really, really impressive just the whole design of yeah. the process. Um, so yeah, I wasn't contaminated or anything. Plus you're probably, like I'm thinking of you now, like this giant cocoon, you're this tiny yeah. little baby, so. Well, I mean, I think what also happens in countries that don't have modern 1984 medical advances is that sometimes they'll put the intestine back in while it's still swollen on kids. Mm -hmm. So they sew them in and they have these like big, large Oof. bellies, but then they'll go back and they'll, they'll actually fix it. So I guess 
Some people have been reopened up. I'll keep letting the air out. Or the, the juice, the sausage Ugh. juice, the meat juice. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what you call it. So I, I find it extremely fascinating just that, okay, there's, there are kids all over the world being born every day with this issue, but not everyone knows about it. I have it. I've had, you know, I had it my whole life. <laughs> I was born that way, but I still don't even really know that much. So in terms of the education of it, I, I don't think it's, it's like a lot of people are talking about it. Because I, I think it's, pr it's pretty interesting. Any kind of birth defect that you just kind of live beyond, I think is, is pretty fascinating. Yeah. I think, so back to this, this series of films, my parents, you know, they're 20, 22, I think. And they don't get to take me home or hold me or do any of those really special new baby, first baby things. Mm -hmm. So I've always felt like really bad about that. But like my parents just, I think were just so grateful that I was okay. But my grandfather, in narrating all of these like <laughs> these episodes of the film, he's like, "If I I can't get in there on St. Patrick's Day, I'm going in there myself." And like, you know what I mean? He's like, uh -huh. and so the last part of this series is my parents get to go in and actually hold me. So I'm finally unhooked from the machines. I'm out of my cocoon. I'm a little butterfly, and they come in and they hold me. And this is this is the thing that got me. When my dad picks me up to hold me, my head is at his shoulder looking out mm -hmm. and I'm looking straight into the camera. And you could tell it's me and my eyes looking right into the camera like, I'm here. And it was so profound to see that because when you think about, you know, babies with birth defects or are held in the hospital or something, you think of them being so weak. And I was just like calm, cool as a cucumber. And just like, I made it. And for modern technology and, and medicine, I just find it extremely impressive that I have grown up somewhat normal life. And we can talk about mm -hmm. how things have been not so normal because of it. But I do think that the issues that I've had is because of a, of a lack, lack of awareness and education and not talking to other people that have it. Yeah. So I think it's it's cool you have this podcast yeah. that maybe someone would hear it and then exactly. they'd be like, hey, let's talk oh. about our sausages. Oh my, <laughs> oh my gastroesthesis <laughs> friends. Gastroesthesis is spelled really weird. It's like C E I S I S or something at the end. But like I said, I have to Google mm -hmm. it. Isn't that weird? It's like you depend on Google like to tell you what who you are your body <laughs> what's my name <laughs> what, 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 yeah. what, what's going on but i as far as like growing up with it my my parents were never like oh hey you should avoid gluten or something like you know there was never any like oh we're gonna follow up or aftercare on it was just, there anything recommended that your parents ignored or was it just like nobody really thought it was any bother i mean not that i'm aware of i mean i think it was just like a Okay, you're born. You're fine now. Yeah. Did you take medication or anything like that? I, not that I'm aware of, no. So I didn't really experience any issues. I mean, I had just chronic constipation since I was an infant. Like, that was an issue because I don't think my intestines, when they went back in, like, it wasn't like they were formed inside my body. So that's what I think has caused all the issues. Were they cut or anything? Or are they just reshaped? What's been explained to me is that because of that trauma, it caused like scar tissue in the intestine. And so, you know, anything you eat or you drink or something is going through all of your intestine. And so it's like road blockages, yeah. right? So when I was, I think I was 15, 15 or 16, and I had won the local community fair farm queen contest in Unionville, Pennsylvania, where I grew up. And so I went to state pageants. The farm queen Yeah, contest? I was the farm queen in 2000. When I went to the state pageants, it's like you have to get together with all the other girls and like, wear these like ball gowns, <laughs> like do a speech, stuff like that. And I remember being on the stage and just being like, oh my God, I'm in so much pain. Oh my God, oh my God. 
And what happens is imagine like you're out watering your garden and you want to kink off the hose and not let water run through it anymore. Mm -hmm. That's what happens with my intestine. So I'm on the stage and it's just, it feels like someone is stabbing you in your intestine and then twisting the knife. Ow. stabbing you in the intestine and then twisting the knife. It's agonizing pain. And I just remember it. I couldn't continue with the pageant or the weekend because I was like, this isn't me being nervous. This is like, I feel like someone is stabbing me and twisting a knife. And so I'd never experienced before. So it was really scary. Fortunately, I was young enough that my parents were with me, but I, I got really, really sick. So it was the first time it happened when I was 15. Luck would have it. The next time it happened was the same night I lost my virginity. Whoa. 18. Okay, for the record. It was 18. Yeah. So three years later. During, before, after? Certainly not before. Started before. <laughs> really? Well, okay. So we took a trip to the Poconos Mountains. Out, You know, graduated high school. Spent the whole summer. It was my first love. And went canoeing so canoeing on the canoed out to this little island to go camping on you know it's that whole thing of like i love you i love you too okay let's do it you know <laughs> finally did it and i like beforehand i was like oh like the same thing like my stomach is killing me and it just kept getting progressively worse and my boyfriend at the time was like we can't stay on this island like you're obviously in chronic pain. And I'm like, it's fine, it's fine. It's like, no, you're getting in this canoe and we're heading back in the dark. And Wait, is this after the fact? After after you lost your virginity? Yeah, or? yeah, okay. that happened. Okay. And I <laughs> I just read a farewell to arms where <laughs> she like the woman's pregnant and, and starting to feel contractions and you know, they're escaping the Nazis in a canoe. And I was like romanticizing the whole experience. Anyway, um, <laughs> that, that's how I made that romantic and memorable. But we got back to the land and um, it's not like I'm, I'm Irish, so I don't throw up. OK, I'm like I can <laughs> drink a bottle of Jameson and um, be fine somewhat. Um, <clears throat> it's not this is where it gets gross. It's not like normal barf. It's bile. It's like green it's really really gross and acidic and disgusting and the host at the pocono house had given me a paper bag to throw up in and my boyfriend at the time had a brand new gt mustang and i'm just like barfing into a paper bag that's just like leaking everywhere and we're just like driving into the woods looking for a hospital in the middle of the poconos in the middle of the night mm. and it, the pain is getting increasingly increasingly worse so when I get into the hospital, I'm trying to tell them how much pain I'm in. But remember, like I said, it's like someone stabbing you in the stomach and then twisting that knife. And it's like, ah, I'd be like trying to talk and I'd be like, wait a minute. Ah! Like just ah, totally immobile. And they're like, what is up with this chick? It's so hard to go in a hospital and you're like, I don't know what's happening. I think this is what's happening. It happened to me before, but... I don't even really understand it and it their like computer system was down so they didn't realize they put me in a room with no painkillers oh. for so long and by the way like they put me on morphine and like upgrades from there like that's how much pain it is someone finally came in gave me some medicine and fortunately my boyfriend at the time his father was get this <laughs> head of the is it gastroenterology department? Gastroenterology. Gastroenterology. Close enough. Okay. In a, in a hospital, the same hospital I was actually born in. So it's very likely that he had even seen me as an infant, which I just thought was really ironic, right? Wow. So he's on the phone with the doctor diagnosing me. He's like, she has a bowel blockage. Um, did you know enough to say that? To, no. To like, okay. The third time it happened, I did. Okay. Okay. So, I mean, I'm only 18 years old mm -hmm. and um, he's telling the doctor what needs to happen. 
and it's the tube of the nose down to my stomach to drain everything out. And I can't have any liquids or food or ice chips, which is just torture. My parents came up to take care of me and I was just like really, really, really stubborn. And I remember just like ripping the tube out of my nose and like doing push-ups on the floor. I was like, I will not be left in this hospital room. Uh, doing push-ups? Yeah. What's I that just, about? Uh, <laughs> no, I was like, <laughs> I just was like, I'm strong. I, I, I don't know. Like it was a dumb teenager. What can I say? Okay. But I didn't, I, I hate hospitals. Like people that go to hospitals all the time and are, are really chronically ill, like I just feel so bad for them because I, I have serious anxiety in, in hospitals and being hospitalized. And I didn't want my parents to leave me up in the mountains. Like I didn't want them to leave me there. And uh, oh my God, my, <laughs> I don't think my parents have ever forgiven me for that. But um, I ended up recovering all right that time. And then the last time it happened was a few years ago. I lived alone at the time and I started feeling those pains. And it was so bad that I couldn't even crawl to my phone and I had like, was living in like a convert, converted garage, right? It's not a lot of square footage to get to your phone. And I just couldn't make it and I finally got it and I called Nathan and I put him on speakerphone. I'm like, just come get me right now. You have to get me. And he didn't even know what to do. He like took me to this like emergency, you know, those emergency places that rip you off and put you in an ambulance and before you know it, you're mm -hmm. 10 grand in debt. Yeah. And I walked, when I got into there, I knew enough from the last time that it happened, like, hey, this is the procedure, but you're in pain so much you can't really communicate. Mm -hmm. And there was like two male nurses coming into the room and I like had a bad experience with a male doctor when I was 18. And I was like, I, I can't have you in here. Like, I'm like, I need help, but I can't have you help me. And it's so hard to communicate when you're, you're just in that much pain. And the person who put the tube up my nose, like did it so badly that my nose was just like gushing blood. Mm. And I'm just like, get me out of here. They put me in an ambulance and then I finally ended up at the ER. And that's where they took me in and, and really started the whole process. And um, I can't imagine what it's like to deal with me. Well, you were in pain. So oh yeah. I mean, I felt so bad about how mean I am when I'm in pain that I like wrote my nurses like Valentine's Day cards and brought them <laughs> chocolates afterwards because I was really freaking out because you never know what your insurance covers or it doesn't cover and you have to be there you can't leave you can't really treat yourself you're at the mercy of them they're not even talking to you really and I remember just being like, I don't know if I can afford this. I, I, and having this just anxiety attack. And the nurse goes like, hey, did you ever hear of this drug? It's going to take the edge off. And then it's like, put that in my system. And I was like, oh, South Park's on. <laughs> like, you know, like, I was like, wow, these drugs work. Like, it's, it's, I, I feel so bad for people that have chronic illnesses. And I'm just like, well, thank God this only happens to me once in a while. What's uh, scary is like I, I've always been too afraid since then to like really go out and travel on my own, especially travel somewhere that I, it's, I'm not close enough to a hospital to really get the treatment that I would need yeah. um, because I could very easily die when a bowel blockage, <laughs> it sounds beautiful, doesn't mm -hmm. it? When a bowel blockage occurs and, and it's, it's the worst pain that you're just like, I will live my life around, you know, being in a safe zone. I, and I don't, I don't have any regrets. Like, I don't feel like it, it's kept me away from doing too much of what I want to do in my own life. But I'm not the type of person that's going to go backpacking in the middle of Thailand and like to get jungle or something. Right. So those are three times? Three yeah. Times. And I have like little scares here and there, like when I stop feeling it happen. But I guess the kinks in the hose work themselves out. But it's, it's, it is terrifying to know that that could happen anytime. 
Is there anything that would exacerbate it? Like, do you have to watch your diet and eat certain things? Or? Well, you know, I've tried to go gluten-free, but being a wedding planner and not eating wedding cake really isn't an option. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, it's not to say, like, gluten Did, causes have, this issue. I, I never said that or Have doctors said, that like, way. anything you should oh, do for your diet or not? Do? I cannot find a good doctor. I can't. First of all, I'm paranoid of male doctors. And then, like, I asked for... A uh, female gastroenterologist. <laughs> GI, GI. GI. I for a GI. And she was so terrible that me just explaining how terrible she was to another doctor in Austin, she knew exactly <laughs> her name. And I was like, God, just my luck. Well, when you get into the, I mean, we could talk forever about the whole healthcare issues and health insurance and accessibility and, and you've, you needing a specialist and and what does that mean and i'm like well do i just deal with this like uh, almost dying once in a while or you know uh, yeah. what are they really going to tell me that would change it so i i don't know i i'm definitely interested and i definitely think it would be cool to talk to other people and connect with other people that have been living with this because maybe they they know more than i do yeah. and I, I consider myself very fortunate that it's only been a near-death experience a few times in my life so I don't know if it's like normal that other people have dealt with this or if this is just how my body has adapted over time. I do get worried about, okay, well, I'm 34 now. I still feel like pretty young. Like, is this something that's going to deteriorate over time? And you don't know any background about this, like whether it will or not? You no, I mean, that's what I'm saying. Like, if you're not going to see a absolutely doctor. Absolutely lack education on my own deficit are, do you feel like you're just kind of in denial like trying to avoid researching it or you just haven't bothered hmm. i guess i haven't bothered because i would have geeked out on that like you know i know you were the first person to show me a baby that was born that way and i was like oh my yeah. god <laughs> so yeah so speaking of babies you know just got married and you know it's funny because it's like get married okay then everyone's asking like are you gonna have kids and we're like you know what Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and my my mom is always right that's just how I've grown up like if I don't listen to what my mom says I'm like god damn it she was right and she's like I'm just really worried about you with your issues if you were to have a child you would die or something. and I'm like oh my god so it's just like not like childbirth isn't like scary as shit anyway but like throwing in this whole like everything could go wrong and 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 then it got my husband really paranoid and he's like i don't i wouldn't want anything to happen to you and i'm like i don't want anything to happen to me let's not do that so it it, it is interesting to have something that's not related you know in terms of how your organ organs are actually like they're my 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 sex organs are mm -hmm. completely fine right. it's just oh what if i had this creature growing in my stomach and pushing my intestines around creature doesn't yeah like babies pregnant. don't grow in your stomach from your well, stomach well you know what i mean yeah like they're they're in there though they're like around. this isn't a they're big moving, area they're, they're moving stuff around yeah yeah so i'd be interested to talk to some moms see if there are any issues well you'd want to find a mom Pregnancy who's got that the same issue you have just, oh yeah that would be pre be pretty interesting i'm putting yeah. it out there I'm putting it out there now with this yeah. podcast would you adopt um, if I wanted to have a children, a child in my house. Yeah. You don't know if you do? I don't know. I'm, I really like my sleep. I really like quiet. I run two businesses. So in terms of time, I feel like I neglect my dogs. Like, I, I feel like, oh, I, I'd be a great mom, but I'd be a terrible mom when I think about the practicalities of it. Yeah. So I don't know. We'll, we'll see who the president is in three years and I'm open to discussion. <laughs> um, yeah, but I, I definitely think about like advocating for children. You know, I work for a nonprofit that helps kids and I definitely have a calling to like mentor and, and maybe try it out, maybe try fostering or something out. But I mean, I'll admit I am a very selfish person. So I don't have a problem with just, you know, traveling and dressing nicely and taking spa days. Because you know, that's and, all I do. And saving your own <laughs> life. Yeah, you, you, I, I mean, you just don't know. So, I mean, there's plenty of children out there that really need love and a home and a safe place. And yeah. maybe that's something I do instead. I don't know. I mean, it does make me kind of sad that this, like, cute little chubby face 
combination of George and I isn't going to like be running around our house, but they grow up to be teenagers and resent you anyway. So yeah. might as well <laughs> avoid that. Yeah. Here's a question I asked yeah. all my friends yeah. on the show. Yeah. What are the benefits, if any, of what you have? Well, I wouldn't say necessarily that there are health benefits to it. However, in the grand scheme of things, I have so much gratitude for my parents. You know, if someone were to say to me, oh, your, your baby's going to come out all deformed and inside out, I'd be like, oh my God, terminate. You know, like, <laughs> Kick it to the I don't necessarily know if I'd give my own self a chance, you know, if I was if I was in my mom's position when she was very young and expecting. I mean, seeing that video of that whole experience unfold over time, it's crazy to see how young my parents were. And they just were just so calm about it and just so happy that I was there and I made it. And that's why I think when I turned and faced the camera and looked into the camera that I could tell that they were there to take care of me and everything was going to be okay. There was no like distress. I wasn't like a crying, freaking out baby, like just really calm and just, I think I was already so grateful for that relationship with them. And, but yeah, it really comes down to a place of gratitude and I, I am very grateful to be alive. Cheers to that. Cheers. Do we have any more to discuss? Or no, unless more? you have other questions. I didn't prepare. Me neither. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What? <laughs> we didn't get into the, the, uh, the gross shit. <laughs> oh, literally? Shit? Yeah, we could. Okay. Gross shit. This is some gross shit. Gross shit. So, like I mentioned... My mom even said, since I was an infant, I've just had, like, chronic constipation. So, everybody poops. But it's a totally gross topic to talk about, but I'm, like, way too comfortable about it because, <laughs> like, I'm just like, how can I poop today? And I've tried different approaches. So, taking laxatives every day is not smart, even if they are organic, right? And I was really happy when I discovered Cascara Sagrada, which is like a, a tree bark that stimulates like your, your intestines, like it gets them, jump starts them. It's like uh, snorting a line of cocaine in your intestine, like, whew, okay. <laughs> and then I think what has been approved that's similar to that, but not as traumatic is Senna. 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 And then um, my new jam is, uh, it's like a prune extract. I've, I've, I've liked that. That's my newest one. So I've dabbled here and there and I'm always trying out new things. Um, when I was living in New York, I went to a doctor that had given me a prescription that I was taking and I was like, this is life changing, this is great. And then they took it off the market because I think it was like killing a whole bunch of old people. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of old constipated people were like, <laughs> like dying <laughs> from, I was like, man, what are they giving me? So I, I think that's been the more day to day issue. I think <laughs> just making myself get up extra early and just spend an hour checking email on the toilet. That's the only time I'll Instagram, you know? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, getting that, that computer work done on the iPhone on the toilet. So that's gross. This is my potty talk. But I, th I think that's been like the biggest hurdle on a day-to-day -day basis because I know if I don't go, I could end up in the hospital. And that's the scary thing. Yeah. yeah. How, how long do you go not go for days? Do you? Oh, I mean, I, I think in high school I would go like a month. A month yeah. without pooping. Yeah, that's why I was like having these issues at like 15 and 18. But, you know, people aren't like out talking about poop all the time. <laughs> so like, I wasn't really paying attention to it as a kid. Like, oh, you should be going three times a day. Like, you know, 
I wasn't thinking about that as a teenager. Um, but then after a couple of these episodes of bowel blockages, it was like very apparent that, oh, this is, this is linked. This is cause and effect right now. So that is kind of a scary thing. And that is a nice thing about being married. We have someone's like, did you poop today? Did you go? (laughs) Do you need some fiber, baby? (laughs) Oh, thanks. This is really nice. I think it's funny when people are like, just drink a cup of coffee. I'm like, what? Or people are like, eat an apple. I'm like, do you think I'm like an idiot? Like, (laughs) don't talk to me. Like, you don't understand. Um, So maybe I should join a chronic constipation group. But I mean, that's how I approach doctors. I'm like, look, these are the issues. And that's like, no one has any answer for me. They're like, try more fiber. Like, One more person tells me to eat more fiber. But considering the fact that, knock on wood, here we go, I don't have any other health issues and I don't really get sick other than like seasonal allergies. Mm -hmm. I feel really grateful. Oh shit! I have had this thought that in my past life I was like gutted. Like either stabbed myself in the stomach or someone else did. You know, like very medieval, like like I, I've always thought that that happened to me in a past life, and I'm pretty interested in it. I always think of it the other way around, that you've come, like, you've, the cause and effect, like, you're reaping what you sow, so you basically stabbed somebody. Oh, really? That's how I would view it. Who knows? I was probably, a, like, a witch burned at the stake in, like, every lifetime. <laughs> um, Except for this one. Oh, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> that, that's pretty interesting stuff, to see, like, what, yeah, if we're carrying karma from our past lives. I'm more fascinating of approaching this like with with that type of curiosity than even like just the actual medical history of other people with with this yeah. deficit. But I I'm excited. I hope somebody hears this and like emails me and like we can chat about it and like trade constipation remedies. That's good. <laughs> just to address how how frequent this happens is like there was a girl in the same hospital that was born in this next day born with the same thing like named jennifer like you know what i mean like it it happens all the time but like people aren't out there talking about it i think it's more common that you hear about like kids with like heart murmurs or this or that or the other but i've never had anyone be like Oh, you must have gastroschisis or, you know, no one's ever Hmm. addressed it with me. And so you kind of feel isolated sometimes when you, when you don't know if anyone else has had this birth defect or whatever issue. And that's what storytelling is so great for. It's true. (laughs) Let them know. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks for the drink. Yeah. It's been fun. Thanks was that me. as painful as you thought it was going to be? No, you've got the pain, not me. Oh, like I feel n- great. What was the saying you said? Like a knife. Stabbing you in the intestine, Stabbing you in twisting the knife. Stabbing you in the intestine. Stabbing you in the intestine, twisting, twisting the knife. Stabbing you in the intestine, oh, twisting it's, the knife. Oh, God. All right. Stabbing you in the intestine and twisting. I mean, thanks for listening, and thanks to Jessica Ryan for sharing her story. Hey, if you like this podcast, you can always subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or whatever your favorite podcast outlet is. You can also sign up for our newsletter at friendswithdeficitspodcast.com. Check us out on Instagram, friendswithdeficits. And to help support the show, as well as listen to special interviews, outtakes, and music, check out Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash friendswithdeficits. I'm Adam Sultan. Until next time, hold it together.